our reading for this morning is the Christmas story. The story from Luke's Gospel of Jesus' birth. Listen to what the Spirit might say to us as we hear this story again. In those days, a decree went out from the Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to the city of David called Bethlehem, because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged, and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in bands of cloth, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. In that region, there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find the child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace among those whom he favors. When the angel had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. When they saw this, they made known what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, as it had been told them. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A few weeks ago, a flyer arrived at my house which was advertising a, a new church which is meeting I think at one of the theaters at Lenox Square. They were inviting people to join them for worship and being December they included in that the, uh, the schedule of Christmas services and one of the things that I noted when I glanced at it was it said Christmas Day no worship enjoy Christmas with your family and shortly after that, I saw an article in the Columbus Dispatch about how some of the churches were choosing to not hold worship today. They had a big service just the night before and figured people would want to stay home with their families and so they just wouldn't bother. And just a couple of days ago, there was another article in USA Today talking about the debate about whether or not to have worship when Christmas falls on a Sunday. And invariably, such debates include the, the, the notion that, well, you know, Christmas is really about family, and let's just let everybody enjoy the family time rather than trying to drag them out on Christmas morning. Now, we just heard the Christmas story. In fact, we just heard all the Bible has to say about Christmas, uh, and there's not much about family there. And for those of you that are going, wait, wait a minute, what about the wise men? Well, the wise men really don't belong in the Christmas story, although we've kind of compressed things. Uh, Jesus may have been two years old by the time the wise men show up. This is it for the biblical story of Christmas, and the notion of it being a family celebration is, is not really there. 
But I really don't have any problem with that. For that matter, I don't have any problem with churches calling off worship today or with people choosing not to come. There are lots of other events when people decide, oh, this Sunday I can't come to worship, or we're on vacation, or we're going to Grandma's for Thanksgiving, or whatever, and those seem legitimate reasons to miss an occasional Sunday worship service. And it's true, a lot of people were here until nearly midnight last night, and that may be a legitimate reason as well. And besides, I'm not really sure that those of us that wouldn't dare miss today really are any clearer on the meaning of Christmas than those who say, well, Christmas is really about family. Those of you who know me well would not be surprised to hear me say that it's difficult for me to resist purchasing a new book by Walter Brueggemann when it comes out. And my most recent purchase from this Old Testament scholar is actually a book of his sermons. And the very first sermon in this collection of his sermons is a sermon from, uh, from Christmas Eve of 1972. In this sermon, which is entitled, Gosh, Some Angels, he tells of how his ten-year-old son has been instructed to write a Christmas play as part of a Sunday school class assignment. And he has chosen to write a dialogue between two of the animals and Bethlehem. And I'm just going to read it to you the way it actually is. Donkey. It sure is cold, is it not? Lamb. It sure is, donkey. Do you know what year it is? Lamb. I think it is year one. Donkey. Did you hear that the Caesar Augustus sent out an order that everyone in the country should be taxed? Lamb. That means that the people will be coming back, does it not? Donkey. Right. Lamb. Here comes somebody now. Donkey. Hey, there's something in the sky. Lamb. Is that not a star? Donkey. Yes, there's something right by it. There are two of them. Lamb, who is that over the hills, donkey? It looks like some people coming to get their taxes on the books. Lamb, but the ends are all full. Maybe they will come here, huh? Donkey, here they come. Lamb, be nice to them, huh? Donkey, she looks like she's going to have a baby. Lamb, hey look, over the hills, it looks like some kings. Donkey, she's having a baby. Look, some angels. Lamb, gosh, some angels. Donkey, the shepherds see the angels. And Brueggemann stops with his son's story. That's all that he reports of it. Because he wants to focus on those angels. Those angels that the animal said, gosh, some angels. And he says that that would be a pretty mild exclamation for when someone actually saw an angel. Angels, we, we've gotten a little confused about angels over the centuries, and this may have something to do with our misunderstanding a bit about what the Christmas story is about. Angels are not what many of us envision. They are not cute. They are not cherub or childlike. They don't have wings for that matter. They, when they show up in the Bible, are usually fairly frightening folks. And that is the case when they show up with the shepherds. Angels in the Bible are, so, are sort of a, a holdover from a more primitive view of religion. If you go back far enough in the history of Israel, there was a time when they worshipped many gods, and, and in their very primitive understanding of religion, the, the heavens were filled with a, a pantheon, a, a multiplicity of gods and goddesses, and these came together to form a, a divine heavenly council. And from time to time, this council would join together and would make decisions about which of them would be king. 
you can find, even though Israel becomes monotheistic and believes in only one God, you can still find in their psalms these gatherings of the heavenly court that announce that God reigns. In other words, that God has been named king. And angels, which are not people who have died and gone to heaven, angels are these divine beings that serve as the messengers of the heavenly court. And the word angel actually simply means messenger. And the angel's job was when the gods, or God, had made one of these decisions about what was to be, they carried the news to earth so that humans knew what was going on. That Yahweh had been crowned God of gods and they had better get straight with Yahweh if they wanted to, know, to, to be in good stead with heaven. And when angels show up, you don't always recognize them at first, but when you do and you realize they're from God, you want to do what the shepherds do in the story. You want to hit the dirt. Angels are nothing to be trifled with, and you want to get down on your face until the angel tells you it's okay to get up because the angel has good news and not bad. And just as when the angels announce in the Psalms that God reigns, the angels do a similar thing in our reading today. It's no historical footnote that Luke includes when he starts his story that in those days a decree went out from the Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. Luke wants us to be sure that we realize that this story takes place in the context of imperial power. Augustus Divine Augustus, who reigns over all the world, who can command everyone in the world to be registered. This is the king. But in that setting, the divine messenger shows up and tells everyday folks like the shepherds, working stiffs like the shepherds, a new king has been born. Not at the palace, though. He's in the barn in that God-forsaken backwater town of Bethlehem. One of the ways we got confused along the way about the Christmas story, and the Christian story for that matter, is we somehow got the notion that Jesus came to take us to heaven. It's even in some of our favorite Christmas carols. We sang it today about taking us to heaven. But the announcement of the angel to the shepherds and Jesus' own proclamation when he begins to preach and teach is not about us going to heaven. It is about the rule, the reign of heaven coming to earth. The angel says, yes, Augustus has ordered everyone to be taxed, to be registered so they can be on the books. But a new king has been born. A king who is Lord of all. Who is over even Augustus. Dare we believe such a thing? In just a few moments, we will celebrate the Lord's Supper. This central sacrament of our church, interestingly, is around a meal. Sustenance for life here on earth. A meal that is meant to nourish those who have believed this crazy story that a new king has been born. To nourish us and sustain us for life that follows that king, that says no to all the other principalities and powers, to corporations and economic systems and governments and militaries, and says no, we have a new king, and we will follow him. And in the liturgy that often accompanies the, the Lord's Supper, there is that saying that they shall gather from east and west, from north and south, to sit at table in the kingdom 
That's not, they shall all go up to heaven. But they shall all come from all over the globe, from every nation, from every tribe, from every race, from every economic system, and they shall all be one and gather at one table when they have all recognized that the God in heaven has decreed a new king is born. We struggle to believe that sometimes. We, we still think that earth is, it belongs to the human realm and, and our powers and our mights, our schemes are what determine destiny, what determine the future. But the angel announces that a new king of earth has been born. Let earth receive her king. <coughs> Dare we believe Dare we believe it. All praise and glory to the King whose birth we celebrate this day. Thanks be to God.